This is Mitchell Sigmund for Acoustica Zeros and Ones blog. Recording and mixing vocals is possibly the most important part of pop and rock music production, so it pays to get it right. In this entry, we're going to offer some tips on each component of the vocal chain. The chain is shorthand for everything in the vocal recording signal path. The simplest possible vocal recording chain might look something like this. Here we have a vocalist and a mic plugged into an audio interface with a built-in mic pre. The audio interface plugs into the computer via its USB connection. The singer's headphones are plugged directly into the audio interface's headphone jack. Let's begin with the most important element of the vocal chain, the performer. Now, making the performer comfortable is really important. So I find that things like dimming the lights or lighting candles or incense can make them feel a little more mellow and comfortable in the environment. And also things like having a beverage around, like herbal tea or lemon water, those are really good for the throat. Um, try to avoid soft drinks and coffee, uh, and try to make them not smoke cigarettes unless they want to sound like Tom Waits. Uh, another thing I find that's important is sometimes people will want to bring a bunch of people with them to the session. And I find that the more people who are in the room when you're recording, the more armchair producers you have. And you also end up with a situation where sometimes the performer is trying to impress their friends, and this never is productive. I always find the best situation for recording is just the engineer, recording person, and the performer one-on-one. -on -one. And that way, you get the most work done and everybody's the most comfortable. Also, different vocalists will have different vocal skill levels and they'll have different amounts of experience recording. So um, sometimes when singers haven't recorded a lot and they're on headphones, when they hear their voice just raw in the headphones up front, it can be really disorienting for them or it's hard for them to get their pitch right. So really go the extra mile to try to get a mix that makes them comfortable. Uh, if necessary, put some reverb on their vocals. Uh, another thing I found if they have trouble with pitch is if they pull one of the headphone cups off of the side of their ear, sometimes they can hear better with their voice being heard in the air around them. And just be careful if you do that, that the one that's off their ear isn't facing the microphone, otherwise you're gonna record the vocal monitor music, which you don't want in your vocal track. But the good part of this is your performer will sound and look just like Michael McDonald. Such a long way to go. I usually set up the monitor mix and the headphones myself before the session starts, and that way I have a pretty good idea that it's in the ballpark. Be aware that the vocal level, the monitor level of the vocal that is, in the headphones will really affect the way the singer sings. For example, if you've got the vocal really compressed or really loud, or both of those things, it's going to make the singer sing more quietly because it's going to blast in their ears if they scream. Whereas if you do the opposite, if you make the vocal level really quiet, it's going to tend to make them scream or put in more effort. And this may be what you want. It really depends on the nature of the track. Um, if you're doing a wild rock and roll song, you're going to want them to work a little harder. But if you're doing a Tori Amos ballad, then you're going to want that intimate, breathy feel. Volumes could be written about coaxing the best performance from a singer, but for now we'll leave it at this. Be aware of the delicate balance of how much to push an artist versus pushing too much and ruining their, their confidence level and making them upset. Um, it really depends on the person you're dealing with. I find there's a few different personality types, and strangely there's only a couple of different personality types. Uh, some people love recording. Some people it's kind of like being in the dentist office where they want to get it over with as quickly as possible. You just have to be aware of all these different personality things and work with it as best you can because at the end of the day, the singer's gonna be really happy with you when you get a great performance from them. Let us talk about microphones. First, we're gonna talk about what you don't want. You probably don't want that. I bought this at the dollar store and uh, it doesn't sound that great, but it does have built-in reverb. You probably don't want this either. This is a dynamic mic and it's primarily intended for live sound reinforcement. These guys are really robust. You can drop them and you probably won't break them. And uh, they have a lot of resistance to feedback in a situation where you've got blasting monitors, which won't matter for us. But they don't sound as good as the large di Hold on. A large diaphragm condenser mic is pretty much the highest fidelity mic you're going to get. Um, these need a 48 volt phantom power source usually, but that's usually included in most modern mic preamps. And 
These sound really, really great. And the best thing about them is they used to be really expensive. It used to cost like over $1,000 and you'd get yourself like a Neumann U87 or something along those lines. But in the last 10 to 15 years, the price of these has come down dramatically. And this here is an Audio-Technica AT4047 with a transformer in it. It's meant to sound like an old Neumann U47 or 67 actually. Um, it's not a tube mic, but that doesn't matter. It still sounds really, really good. It's about a $500 mic, but I've actually heard mics that cost half that, that sound just as good as this. Also, you're going to want a uh, one of these, which they call a popper stopper. This goes in front of the mic. And the idea behind this, besides making you look like you're in the We Are The World session, is uh, <laughs> they stop plosives. And what a plosive is, is any sort of hard P or B sound. So when you're in front of the mic, you're not going, -ba 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 -ba, which sounds really terrible when you actually get it into your DAW and start editing it. So the idea is these stop that. Um, again, depending on your singer, some singers will be more aware of this than others. And back in ye old days, before they invented pantyhose in front of a mic, singers would actually put their hand in front of their mouth whenever they did a P or B sound to sort of damp that sound. Most modern audio interfaces include two or more channels of microphone preamps, like this Lexicon Lambda right here, and here are my little input level knobs for the mic pre's. And you can see on the back, there's XLR inputs, and there's also a 48 volt phantom power for condenser microphones. Now, you can use the internal ones, which usually sound pretty good, or you can get an external mic pre. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, budget external mic pre's, some of them boasting tubes and that sort of thing. But in my opinion, you usually don't get a lot of audio improvement with a cheap mic preamp. And the warm tube sound that you often hear about in advertisements is actually usually <laughs> attributable to the transformers in fancy mic preamps. And transformers are not really easy to make cheap if you're going to make really good ones. So unless you're going to spend a little bit of money, it's probably best just to stick to the internal mic priest. Um, that said, there are some really great sounding bargains to be had, relatively speaking, the, in the $500 and up region from companies like Golden Age, Warm Audio, and Focusrite. Now, one thing you may be asking is, hey, Mr. Acoustica, fancy blog guy, uh, can't I just use one of Acoustica's built-in compressor plugins and not use an external compressor? And you can absolutely do that. Um, I prefer an external compressor because I'm fancy and stuff. And the nice part about that is it sort of preconditions your tracks going in, your vocal recording, and pre-levels it. So you're already kind of most of the way there as far as compressing it so it sits really well on a track. But you can absolutely use one of Acoustica's built-in compressors. And if you put one on the recording channel that you're using, the performer will hear the compression in their headphone mix, but Mixcraft won't print the compression to the recorded track. And this is really nice, actually, because that means you can really squash something for the performer or back it off or however they want it set in their headphones. And then when you're mixing the track later on, you can really fine tune the settings of the compressor. Now, what I do is I actually use my external compressor over here, my Longevin, and um, I actually compress on the way in quite a bit. And then when I'm mixing, I'll add another compressor in the channel strip. So I kind of have double compression at that point. And you'll find that, again, for pop stuff, you almost can't have enough compression. I mean, you'll you'll hear if it's really pumping and sounding gross, but most pop tracks are pretty well compressed. If you are using one of Mixcraft's internal compressors, I would start with the classic compressor. It's pretty easy to use and it sounds great. And it also defaults to the uh, vocal preset, so you're pretty well in the ballpark where you need to be. And to increase the amount of compression you hear, you'll take the threshold knob and you'll actually turn it counterclockwise. You'll notice that in the preset position, it's pretty far up. And actually turning it counterclockwise squashes more. And you'll see the red light that shows the compression will come on more. Um, you may notice an overall decrease in volume as you're getting more compression. So then you'll take the output knob all the way on the right and you'll turn that guy up to account for the loss of overall level that you're getting. Here's another tip. If you're using an audio interface's internal mic pre's and you want to use an external compressor, some audio interfaces, like my Lexicon Lambda over here, actually have an insert jack over there. And that lets you use an insert cable, like one of these guys. And you can take that, oh, wrong side. You can take that and put it in Mr. Insert over there. And then you can send in return 
to uh, an external compressor. If you don't want to show out the ducats for a separate mic pre and compressor, so-called channel strips uh, combine a mic pre and a compressor and often other things like EQs and saturation and de and things like that all in one box. Uh, these are really cool. Uh, the only thing is you will want to be careful how much of that stuff you use when you're tracking vocals because, for example, if you track your vocal with de and saturation and stuff like that, it will be stuck in the track in that sense. Like you won't be able to remove it later. So I generally just record with a little bit of EQ to get any low end rumble out, like passing garbage trucks and air conditioners and stuff. And sometimes I boost the highs a little bit for a little bit more sparkle. Uh, I do use a fair amount of compression, but I really don't want much else on there because anything else I can add after the fact. Uh, my particular unit is a Longevin dual vocal combo. They don't make this anymore. It's from a company called Longevin, and they were the solid state uh, version of uh, Manly, which is really high-end tube stuff, so the solid state line was a little more affordable. But there's some good deals out there on channel strips, and they work out really well. Though it's possible to record vocals and other sources using your computer's internal audio, you're going to have much better fidelity and ease of use with an external USB audio interface. Uh, you'll likely want to model with built-in mic preamps, but most of them have built-in mic preamps these days anyway, so you're probably good there. And the biggest advantage of using an external audio interface is that you'll be able to set it for much lower latency. And what that means in English is uh, when you're recording and monitoring the recording, uh, the singer, or whatever you're recording, they'll hear, hear a, a delay, delay which, which usually sounds kind of like a slapback delay. And so that makes it much harder for the performer, obviously. And uh, a nice audio interface will let you set really low latency so you won't hear that nasty slapback echo on the monitored signal. Uh, another advantage of a low latency audio interface is when you're playing virtual instruments live, like a keyboard, uh, they'll be much more responsive because the sound will happen much quicker. If you have high latency, like a high latency setting, uh, you'll hit the key and you'll be able to feel a little delay between when the sound comes out and when you hit the key. So low latency audio interface, excellent idea.